So uh, I was wondering what to say this year. I, no I noticed last year that I actually made three presentations because during the previous 12 months, we've been doing an awful lot of work on uh, the core of our main application. And so there was lots of uh, new fourth code in there that I could talk about. But uh, unfortunately, of course, that doesn't actually earn you any money. Uh, we were unable to do any installations for about 12 months. Fortunately, this year, we've started to do lots more installations. So we're earning rather more money, but we haven't been really working on the core of the fourth system. So I was wondering what on earth could I possibly talk about? And uh, I came up with this very tiny little addition, which has proved quite useful and which we've added to all our uh, applications. That is uh, a little um, wrapper for log files. So I thought I'd talk about that. Uh, my, yeah. So what does a log file look like? Uh, so here is the log of a complete little uh, TrackNet session. So uh, everything except the last entry there describes what happened when the application started. And then the bottom entry described what happened when the application was correctly closed. And looking from left to right across this log, you'll see the date and time and the uh, application and then the class of log which you've made there. In other words, how serious it is. Well, nothing went wrong on this session. So uh, all of the seriousness, seriousness levels there were info, uh, no errors or warnings or anything like that. And then is the uh, specific text that you uh, actually want to put in there. So at the bottom there, we can see TrackNet closed. And then after that is the actual fourth word from which the logging was called. So uh, if we look four lines up there, for example, uh, the, the text which we've composed is the TCP IP server is listening on the port number. And then next start local is the fourth word from which that was called. And then we've got the name of the source code file and then the line of the word from which the logging system was called right at the end. So uh, the great thing about that is that you can trace uh, whatever happened straight back to your source code really rather easily. So uh, why would one want to use log files in the first place? Well, it, once you start using Linux, you realize that log files are a very Linuxy sort of thing. And it turns out that they're actually quite useful. Um, they're useful, for example, um, when you've got an application which has a large number of dependencies, uh, sometimes it fails to start, and this enables you to locate uh, precisely what caused it to fail to start. And uh, occasionally you've made a mistake and something terminates completely unexpectedly, and this gives you some chance as to uh, why the termination happened. And uh, finally, you can figure out um, what the customer did sometimes uh, if the customer managed to mess things up. And then there are uh, considerations for using log files. Well, of course, um, they can get very long if you're reporting a very large number of events. Um, and to combat that, you can use automatic truncation. So you can automatically delete any entries which are more than a couple of days old or something like that. And there are also tools to enable you to search for key elements within the log files. So uh, there are several different contenders for logging libraries. And we chose uh, Zlog for these reasons here. It's got a, a good license. The interface is pure C, so we can easily uh, connect to it from forth. Uh, it has no dependencies. Um, it's easily customized, so uh, we can report on exactly the right items that we want to include. And one of the great things is that it has, um, it doesn't take much computing time at all. So you can feel free to put in log messages all over the place without ha having any bearing on the performance of your application. So all in all, it's got all the necessary things that we want. So here's a little example of uh, 
some log information um, added to a fourth word, and this is where we're connecting to our database. And that down the bottom there, um, if you fail to get a connection, um, there's the text that appears, uh, which is concatenated, as you can see, with the uh, error message which comes back from the database itself. So you can see the reason for the failure in database connection. And uh, this is for our TrackNet program where a database is absolutely essential. So uh, if you're unable to get a database connection, that is a fatal error. So we've just got a little word fatal there, which does the logging and then does a few other things as well. So uh, you've got six levels of seriousness. Uh, uh, you can make a, as many levels as you like, but there are six basic levels of seriousness available. Uh, ranging from debug, the normal one, info, and then uh, errors and fatal at the other end. Uh, so uh, I've um, brought these all together um, so that most of the work is done by a common word there. Uh, and uh, you can see that this is an immediate word, so it starts compiling stuff. Um, the, it does, it, it, fatal itself is just one part of it. Now, um, I thought, well, um, what shall I present this year? And I thought, well, I, I have to present something which has got the word postpone in it, because after all, if you're a, a, a respectable fourth programmer, you must do postpone and this kind of thing. So there is one postpone in this code. Um, this is the bit where it automatically compiles uh, the, fi the file name, the fourth word, and the line number into uh, your fatal message there, or your info message. Uh, what happens at runtime? Well, you retrieve all those parameters that you've done there, and then do the external library call. Uh, and you also optionally um, show the message uh, somehow or other and do something with it. So uh, here is the show bit. Well. If it's an error, then really uh, the end user needs to know about that. So assuming that it's only um, a sort of error, but your graphical system is still working, then you might actually, within your own application, try and display a dialog box to tell the user what's going on there. If it's a fatal, however, um, you have to actually terminate the application. And um, this uses um, Stephen Pelt's bailout word which is a last resort word, but also um, sends a return code. So the application itself is obviously started from a script. So the script will get that uh, return. And even if your own um, graphical system is unable to report what's happened, it might be possible um, for your script to actually take the final entry in the log file and uh, put that up on, on screen so that the, the end user at least has some idea as to what's gone wrong. And then, uh, um, of course, Uli liked his uh, verbose word here. And so if you're in verbose mode, then you can show the information on the standard, standard output anyway, irrespective of uh, what the seriousness level is. So uh, that's all really, it's a tiny feature, but it turns out to be a very useful feature and we've added it to all our applications. Um, and it's very easy to add to an existing application. So that's about all, thanks very much. Thank you. Any, any questions? If you have questions, please raise your hand by clicking on the icon to the lower left, or lower right. So, Ulrich, please. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, less than a question than a comment. Uh, uh, I you, uh, uh, had the experience that uh, even in large industrial environments, uh, this is used uh, quite a lot. So uh, when working with Heidelberg printing presses, uh, there were extensive log messages that could do filtering afterwards uh, because it was a huge distributed system uh, to, uh, uh, and used uh, for uh, after crash error, de uh, error uh, hunting and uh, error exactly. detection. So that's uh, it, it's essential. And I can 
think of a larger installation that doesn't provide things like this. Andrew Reed. Oh, it's, Thank uh, you, Nick. Some... This is yeah. a um, this, okay. this is Sorry. A <laughs> to uh, to display my own ignorance. So, it's, is it multi-threaded? Do you, does the sort of logging yes. handle in the different threads? Yeah, so the uh, the whole logging. thing is thread safe. So you can add um, info messages, for example, from any thread on the system. Right, and then mm -hmm. then the the log the, the log handling piece of your fourth is that in a separate thread so that your application can do whatever it's is the, uh, the basically you're compiling all the parameters and then you uh, you call the library function and the library function itself is thread safe so uh, it does it all for you basically it's it serializes the writing to the log file thanks Nick all right. Peter next. My concern was simply that the log file had an accuracy of one second. I've been working with logs recently where I have, if I remember rightly, it was about two to three million records in a day, which is more than two a second. Oh, uh, right. The, um, one of the nice things about the Z-Log, it, it does have a, a, a high degree of uh, time accuracy, uh, but you can, um, and I, I believe it, it does record to millisecond um, accuracy, uh, but you can format uh, the way the log file actually displays itself. So that's the result. The one second accuracy there is the result of uh, our uh, formatting um, code there. Fair enough. And Python. Uh, the file and the line number is, I think, best displayed in a way that the editors can parse it because you just want to take the log into your editor and click on this and get to the line. So it should be in the format the typical C compiler or whatever outputs file colon line number. Yeah, I just again you can you've got free formatting there, so you could format yeah. it, uh, it. This is outside of fourth. There's um, a Z-log configuration file which uh, determines the way that it's formatted. Yes. So you could you could format it that way if you if you liked. I I just decided yeah. to make it uh, easily human readable. You know. Yeah, but editor readable at this point is probably better because yeah, when you have an editor, click on it and. There you Ex are. Experience will decide. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Gerard Wodny. Yeah, Remark from Twitch. It's a practical application for an app on uh, Linux. It's remarkable. Uh, and a question from me. Uh, are you uh, interested in putting this on the ForceNet as a package, as this seems to be a nifty little packageable thing? Yeah, I was, I was wondering actually how to do that. Um, in our code, um, we use these chain things for starting and stopping stuff at the beginning and end of the application. And so, of course, that's, uh, uh, the, the code that we, we're using is dependent on the, uh, the chains actually existing. So we, in order to make it fully compatible, then we would have to do some tiny little modifications uh, in order to make it useful to fully fully useful to other people there. But yeah, yeah, be absolutely fine to put it on. I mean, it's very simple. It really is uh, only, um, you know, two or three pages of code. Yeah, but it's, you know, it's two or three pages everybody has to write. So it would be cool if it's on there. And if you're having concerns with the chains, I think you can just put a bracket if at the beginning, if it's VFX, and just tell yep. people if it's not, they have to uh, create the code themselves. Yeah, yeah, I can just put a couple of comments on there. Uh, that would be absolutely fine. After the conference, we'll do that, shall we, Gerald? Thank you. Philip um, Does Z-Log allow you to have sort of several loggers um, across your code so that you can tweak the, uh, the log level that you want to see depending on, uh, on the place in the code? So the experience that I made with things like log4j or so is that that is super useful that you can uh, at some point uh, really uh, tune into the finest details of your of your core algorithm in one part, but not get spammed with the megatons of uh, of logs from other parts. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I've learned this, learned to to to, to appreciate this as a, as a almost key feature of a logging logging system. Uh, does Zlog allow something like that, and would it be possible to to integrate that into Forth? I haven't investigated that. Uh, I have to say, so that's something to be looked into. I mean, um, at the moment, provided nothing goes wrong. Um, the, you don't see a great deal on the log file. It's only if things are starting to go wrong that you see large number of entries in the warnings and so forth. So a typical use case that, that I have for logs is also give me a chance to um, trace what is my, my app actually doing, my, my server. Ah, my system. No, we, we actually use um, different arrangements. For example, for tracing operator actions, um, there's stuff like that actually goes into the database. So um, I believe I did a presentation several years ago on uh, privileged actions. So when you log on to the system, you, you, uh, you, you log on and you have a privilege level, and that depends on whether you can actually do certain things or not. Mm-hmm. So uh, for example, uh, somebody logs on and they've got a privilege which allows them to delete the image of a load on our system. And then, uh, so that's all deleted. And then um, two days later, they give us a, a call and say, um, something has miraculously disappeared from our system and we didn't do it. And we can then look into our database, of course, and see exactly who pressed the delete button. Mm-hmm. But that's, that's done by the database, not by the log files. Got it. And the final question by Ulrich Hoffmann. Yeah, and another best practice remark uh, concerning, oops, uh, concerning the uh, the uh, time that you put in the log files. And uh, as I know, you have international projects uh, and you are at uh, some different location when uh, looking uh, at the logs. Uh, um, our uh, experience is that it's best to put universal time timestamps in there, regardless where you are in the log files. So you always know at what time you can recalculate the local time uh, from that. But um, maybe you have different installation and you want to correlate logs, uh, then it's best uh, that you don't need to convert uh, the, uh, the timestamps from local time to some uh, uh, comparable time frame. So using universal time all the time is fine. It needs some explanation if end users look at it, but uh, the logs are not for end users anyways. So you no, know it. The, and the logs are only for our purpose. Yeah. Uh, but that's a very good suggestion, actually. Um, at the moment, the furthest away that it, we've managed to go because of the difficulty in traveling to install these systems, the furthest, furthest we've managed to go is Sweden, which is not too many hours away. But um, we, we actually had, do have three inquiries from Hong Kong at the moment. And uh, we're doing remotely some work in Australia as well. So that issue is is likely to come up. So that's a very good suggestion. Thank you very much. Yeah, especially if you do remote debugging and you're locked into some system. Yes, then, yes. Uh, you never know where it is. The, the yeah. amount of remote debugging that we've been doing in the last two years has absolutely shot up. Okay. <laughs>